this was a battle that would last more than 11 months. 11 months from D-Day to June the 6th, 1944. The surrender was signed on May the 8th, 1945. Seven months of combat, during which the Allied armies, along with thousands of French resistance fighters, battled to liberate the country. Madeleine Riffaut is 90. She was just 19 when she took up arms. Il avait mal. Il fallait que le mal cesse, que cesse le racisme, le l'antisémitisme, le manque de liberté. In every liberated town, the scene was the same. The same crowds with a new sense of hope from Cherbourg to Paris, Aix-en-Provence to Orléans. Jean Mouchel is 84. He was just 14 when he saw the liberators arrive. On était dans l'euphorie de l'espoir, de la joie. On avait un monde à refaire, un, un monde à reconstruire. Et je me rappelle, euh, il y avait des, des slogans partout. On voyait ça, on voyait des images. Retroussons nos manches et ça ira encore mieux. But behind this jubilation, this hope, there was another reality, chaos. Settling of scores, scenes of violence, summary executions. Justice was handled in the streets. Pierre Roux is 89. At the time, he was only 20. He still remembers the atmosphere of fear and insecurity. We n'importe qui pour n'importe quoi. Il suffisait que quelqu'un dise mon voisin. This period of the liberation left an indelible mark on the history of France. Yet even today, 70 years after the fact, there is much that we still do not know. There are unbelievably courageous heroes who are not in the history books. Incredible ploys used to deceive the enemy. Shameful acts that were silenced. Taboo events that have disappeared from the official memory. It is this hidden side of the French liberation that we are going to explore. People often forget that the liberation of France did not happen on that fateful day of June the 6th, 1944, with the Allied landings. Even if the more than 150,000 soldiers that day revived the hopes of the French people when they set foot in Normandy. In reality, the future of France was playing out thousands of kilometers from there. This is Algiers on the shores of the Mediterranean. Several days earlier, General de Gaulle, head of the Free French Forces, had just created a provisional government. And he fully intended to govern the country after the liberation. Except that behind his outward composure, he was worried. Because he knew that the Allies had no intention of allowing this to happen. Ni les Américains, ni les Britanniques, ni les Soviétiques ne reconnaissent ce gouvernement. Tout simplement parce que, suivant euh, l'avis du président Roosevelt, ce gouvernement n'est pas légitime. On the other side of the Atlantic, in the White House, the future of France had already been determined. American President Franklin Roosevelt did not want General de Gaulle to lead the country. It was inconceivable that a soldier without any democratic legitimacy would run the future government. On the ground, therefore, the Allied administration had already taken all necessary steps to manage the future of a country they considered to be on the losing side and which had collaborated with Germany. 
In Normandy, there were more than just soldiers among the troops. There were nearly one and a half thousand administrators, officers specially trained to supervise the administration of a liberated France. À la libération, euh, il faut que la France soit administrée euh, par les Alliés en attendant qu'elle euh, se reconstruise. Un processus qui, aux yeux du général, est tout à fait criminel, puisqu'il revient à dénier et la souveraineté de la France et la réalité du pouvoir du général de Gaulle. Even more surprising, Washington actually had French banknotes printed in the United States. Like these, five, ten, and hundred franc bills. In all, a stash of 40 billion. Soldiers in Normandy were already using these made in America francs. For General de Gaulle, this was unacceptable. It was tantamount to making France an American colony. L'histoire de cette monnaie, elle est très révélatrice parce que sur les billets, il n'est nullement fait mention de De Gaulle, ça on aurait pu s'en douter. Il n'est fait nulle mention euh, du gouvernement provisoire et même les termes République française n'apparaissent pas sur les billets. General De Gaulle could only see one way to block the American project so that a liberated France would be run by his government. The country had to rise up and participate actively in its own liberation. France had to be liberated by the French. A France that was no longer on the side of the losers, but with the winners. This is the message the general sent in his speech of June the 6th. Pour les fils de France, où qu'il soit, quel qu'il soit, le devoir simple et sacré est de combattre par tous les moyens dont il dispose. Il s'agit de détruire l'ennemi. La France a été battue en six semaines, en 1940, Et il faut absolument racheter ce péché en montrant que les Français n'attendent pas passivement, comme Cendrillon, l'arrivée de leurs libérateurs, les mains dans les poches, qu'ils participent activement à leur libération. General de Gaulle's speech was distributed widely by the resistance. In the days that followed, the insurrection began in several towns in France. French people everywhere took up arms to battle the Nazi enemy. But liberating the country while the Americans were still far away was no easy task. Many of the oldest, most experienced resistance fighters had already been arrested and executed by the Germans. Therefore, an entirely new generation joined the resistance. Young French people, some barely 20 years old, who, to liberate their country, would conduct unbelievably courageous acts, risking their lives. Among them, a young woman, Madeleine Riffaut. She was 19. Don't be deceived by appearances. Behind this vision of a polite young woman stood a tough and determined young fighter. What did we hear on the radio? The voice of the old Maréchal Pétain chevrotante et qui disait « Soyez courtois avec l'occupant. » Bah, j'ai pas envie, moi. J'ai pas signé l'armistice, moi. C'est pas moi qui l'ai signé. Euh, dis donc, euh, vieux con. Euh. Madeleine Riffaut's story is one about an ordinary young French woman who was never destined to become a hero, but whose incredible bravery would earn her a respected place in history. It all started in 1942. Born in a village in Picardy, Madeleine moved to Paris to study medicine at the Sorbonne. She wanted to become a midwife. But without telling her parents, she joined a group of student resistance fighters. As soon as she could, she carried out propaganda missions. She put up posters in the street. She smuggled letters for the resistance. These activities could have cost her her life. But this petite woman soon began to impress her superiors. Les actions relativement légères qu'elle a pu faire, elle les a faites, elle a donné confiance. On voit son, son engagement, et, et sa passion, son, euh, son assurance aussi, et sa, et sa son sens de la responsabilité. C'est pas une, c'est pas une faux folle. Madeleine was level-headed. She was rapidly promoted to group leader. 
she commanded four men and took on a code name, Rainer. Elle a suivi une formation militaire hein, euh, au maniement des armes. Euh, elle a, on lui a fait transporter des, du, du matériel pour, euh, pour sa beauté. In these rare images, Madeleine appears surrounded by a group of fighters. And when the streets became a battlefield, she was given a new mission. Alert. Grouillez-vous. Il y a un train qui vient de Ménilmontant par la petite ceinture. Hein? Et il est bourré d'Allemands. Yes, a train was on the move. 14 cars filled with rifles, a ton of ammunition, a hundred soldiers. It was an extremely important convoy for the Germans. This train arrived via the Gare de Lyon. It took what was called the small ring. The resistance fighters feared that it was trying to reach the Gare de l'Est, because right near there, on Place de la République, was an enormous military barracks, the German Prince Eugène Barracks. If the reinforcements reached it, a new front would open and take the resistant fighters from behind. In short, if the train got through, there could have been a bloodbath. On arrive là dans la, dans la, la, la folie et la folie carnassière euh, des troupes. Donc il y a un risque là, il y a un risque de, de massacre, de massacre au nord de Paris sur euh, ce qui peut y avoir d'embryons de, de barricades. Madeleine only had three people to stop the train. The rest of her group was mobilized to fight in the streets. So she gave an order to take all the explosives they had left. And the small group headed to the Butte Chaumont Park, because that's where Madeleine wanted to intercept the train. On file en voiture avec nos armes. Et quand on arrive sur le pont des Buttes Chaumont, ben, on voit déjà le train. The military convoy had stopped just inside the tunnel. All around, soldiers were inspecting the tracks, making sure everything was clear. Hidden in the trees, Madeleine and her men were covered. But there were only four of them against a hundred Germans. The train could have started up at any time. It had to be stopped at all costs. So Madeleine immediately decided to use everything she had at hand. Alors, on commence à déballer notre, euh, notre camelote et on jette nos explosifs sur la locomotive. Donc, je balance euh, tout ce qui a balancé. Ça fait une énorme explosion qu'on n'avait pas prévue, je dois dire. Euh, on avait jeté vraiment beaucoup. The resistance fighters lobbed grenade after grenade. Convinced they were facing a small army, the Germans got scared and retreated into the tunnel. Madeleine then decided to go for broke. With her three comrades, she dropped down onto the tracks and threw all the smoke bombs they had left inside to asphyxiate the enemy. The soldiers had no choice but to stop fighting. Several minutes later, a photographer captured this scene of the German soldiers caught by a handful of resistance fighters. Ils se sont rendus, les pattes en l'air, et puis ils sont rendus tranquillement, et c'était 80. By stopping the train, the young woman prevented the German counterattack and provided the resistance fighters with weapons that would be extremely useful in the days to come. This was August 23rd, 1944, and coincidentally also the day of her 20th birthday. In the thick of the battle, Madeleine Riffaut had forgotten all about it. On the Champs-Élysées, August the 26th, 1944, France erupted in joy. General de Gaulle was cheered by a crowd that hadn't been seen here for more than four years. And at the Hotel de Ville, he gave a speech that would go down in history. Paris, Paris outragé, Paris brisé, Paris martyrisé, mais Paris libéré. But above all, he sent a crucial message to the world. The French recaptured their capital by themselves. Libéré par lui-même, 
libéré par son peuple avec le concours. Les armées de la France avec l'appui et le concours de la France tout entière. The general knew that he was close to achieving his goal. And his provisional government, which the Americans had not wanted, finally received official recognition from the entire Allied camp. But even though the capital was freed, the rest of France was far from being entirely liberated from the German occupiers. It would still take months for the Allied forces and the resistance fighters to take back the entire country. Advancing step by step after violent battles. And in every town where the Germans handed over their weapons, this is what the news of the time showed. Jubilant crowds. Crowds cheering the liberators. People relieved to be free of the occupiers. And yet, behind these images of crowds celebrating their newfound freedom, most French people were experiencing another reality, a much darker one. Pierre Roux was 19 at the time. He remembers it all as if it were yesterday. It's after the liberation les quelques jours qui ont suivi, parce que quand on arrêtait n'importe qui pour n'importe quoi, il suffisait que quelqu'un dise « mon voisin était ça », on l'arrêtait. À ce point, en France, il était temps de s'étonner les scores. Les femmes étaient étonnées en public, parce qu'elles étaient étonnées de dormir avec les Allemands. Les autres gens étaient étonnées en pleine nuit, en face de caméras, parce qu'elles avaient collaboré avec l'ennemi. Vous avez une population qui est euh, excédée par quatre années d'occupation. Vous avez des résistants qui ont parfois euh, été euh, très durement réprimés, non seulement par les Allemands, mais également par l'appareil d'État vichyste, et que toute une partie de la population française réclame vengeance. C'est une période agitée, violente. Euh, C'est pour ça que je parlais de, de climat, de, de guerre civile. Une guerre civile qui est probable, possible. Après tout, euh, Vichy vient de tomber. Euh, normalement, De Gaulle prend le pouvoir, mais euh, d'autres factions de la résistance ont aussi leur mot à dire. Il euh, y a une inquiétude. Et le problème était, avec ce risque de chaos, les Français n'avaient pas no de autorités compétentes qu'ils pouvaient trust. Because under Vichy, the police had collaborated with Germany, and they were completely discredited in the eyes of the people. The security forces had essentially disappeared. La police, pour beaucoup de gens, elle incarne la visibilité de la collaboration. On a vu des policiers français garder les immeubles allemands. On a vu des policiers français opérer ce qu'on appelle des rafles. Donc la police, je ne sais pas comment vous dire ça autrement, elle est décrédibilisée. In the absence of any credible police force, the people who would maintain law and order were none other than the resistance fighters themselves. In Paris, by late August 1944, they controlled the police headquarters. And to announce the fact, they painted police in large white letters on their cars. At this point, the FFI, the French forces of the interior, were no longer resistance fighters, but had become security forces that wielded power. I think it's important to remember who holds the power? The one who holds the power of police, the one who holds the power of justice. So, somewhere, create a police and FFI, whatever the name we give him. That is, people with a hat, a gun, and arms that come to arrest a little bit in Paris. We say that it's them who hold the power. The goal of the FFI? To maintain order and above all, to arrest and judge the collaborators. At this point, people's courts were being set up all over the country, notably in Lyon, Grenoble, Montpellier, Toulouse, and Paris. Members of the resistance had free reign to maintain law and order, and some exceeded all bounds in exercising this power. 
Les victimes ne sont pas écoutées. Mais en tout cas, on est dans un cadre qui, qui relève d'une pseudo-justice. Il y a tout un tas de gens qui arrêtent, il y a des gens qui jugent, il y a des gens qui exécutent. Ils sont complètement en marge des lois. This is the dark side of the liberation, a subject that's taboo, that has been kept out of our history books for years. One place in particular was notorious for its abuse of vigilante justice. The place? The Institut Dentaire in Paris, an enormous brick building in the 13th arrondissement of the French capital. On August 20th, 1944, members of the resistance requisitioned the Institute to create a court of sorts. The amphitheater was transformed into a collective internment room. All those in the Paris region arrested for collaboration with the German occupiers during the war were judged, then imprisoned at the Institut Dentaire. Residents who had denounced their Jewish neighbors, members of the militia who had hunted down resistance fighters, ranking officials who had worked hand in hand with the Nazis. Presiding over the Institute, a man named René Santuc, an all-powerful figure who was more well-known at the time as Capitaine Bernard. But he was a captain who had not really had the time or opportunity to do much in the resistance. In fact, he spent the years of occupation in this prison near the city of Chartres, then in an internment camp near Chateaubriand because this communist militant had been arrested in 1940 and incarcerated for four years during the Vichy regime. He managed to escape only a few months before the liberation to join the communist resistance. Very quickly, he was given the mission of leading the court at the Institut Dentaire in Paris. And with him, a dozen other resistance members, all following his orders. Ils ont tous cette vision d'un type d'une froideur extrême hein, qui, de temps en temps, a, a quand même des moments, des accès de fureur et de quelqu'un d'extrêmement de, dur, hein, bien sûr, et sans pitié, impitoyable, hein, au sens propre. Et comme euh, c'est la mission, de, justement, d'épurer, de, 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 de tuer les, les, les ennemis euh, de la Résistance et du Parti communiste est une mission prioritaire, il va, il va, il va euh, remplir sa mission. René Santuc's men soon arrested dozens of collaborators. The Institut Dentaire would become one of the main sites for the purging operations run by the resistance. In less than one month, 200 people were incarcerated. And they didn't follow any rules, any procedures. Il n'y a pas d'enquête, il n'y a pas de contre-enquête, il n'y a pas d'avocat, on ne vérifie rien. On fonctionne sur la rumeur publique. La rumeur peut tuer sous l'occupation et la rumeur peut tuer encore dans le Paris de la Libération. Rumors and denunciations. Using these methods, René Santuc's men increased their arrests. But this meant that innocent people were taken and irreparable crimes committed. For example, we searched through the archives of the Paris police headquarters located in the suburbs. It is an enormous warehouse with shelves storing hundreds of thousands of documents. Every crime, large and small, committed in Paris in the last 150 years is recorded here. Among the boxes, a blue file, number 77W924, dated March the 20th, 1946 a file that contains revealing information about the Institut Dentaire. Inside, a police investigation conducted after the war examines the circumstances of a woman's death. A certain Madame Goa. According to this report, Madeleine Goa, who had no record whatsoever, was found dead on August 29th, 1944. The document includes the information that the body was riddled with bullets. The police report concluded with these words. She was apparently arrested and shot by mistake by the FFI at the Institut Dentaire. But how and why was an innocent person executed?
Je crois que c'est l'exemple le plus abouti. Il y en a des centaines d'autres, hein, mais c'est un des exemples les plus aboutis, les plus tragiques de cette situation, qui est celle aussi de la libération. This dramatic story started on August the 25th, 1944. On that day, the troops of General Leclerc's 2nd Armored Division entered Paris to liberate the capital. But the battle was still raging in the streets, far from the crowds cheering the French and Allied soldiers along the main avenues of Paris. Tensions remained high, particularly on the left bank along Avenue d'Italie. Just a few days earlier, die-hard partisans of Nazi Germany were shooting from the rooftops. While the tanks of the 2nd Armored Division were rolling down the avenue, hundreds of Parisians were still fearful of those isolated snipers. Among them, a couple, Max and Madeleine Goa, who were watching the troops from their balcony through a telescope. The problem, however, was that from a distance, a telescope looks like the barrel of a rifle. Et quelqu'un, euh, la phobie, vous savez, c'était incroyable folie à l'époque des tireurs des toits. Tout le monde se met à tirer dans toutes les directions. Euh, les désigne comme étant des tireurs des toits. La foule s'engouffre dans l'escalier, euh, force les portes, euh, lâche à moitié les goas, pille l'appartement en passant d'ailleurs, où on évidemment on ne trouve ni, ni fusil ni rien. It was a misunderstanding. But no one would listen to Madeleine or her husband. The couple was dragged into the street, while the 2nd Armored Division continued to roll along in the middle of the crowds. And that's when tragedy struck. Et euh, Max Goa, euh, auquel la foule fait déjà un très mauvais sort, est jeté sous les chenilles d'un char German de la 2e DB. Max Goa died instantly. Madeleine was in shock, and she was taken to the Institut Dentaire to be judged. When she arrived, the courtroom was full. Dozens of prisoners were waiting to be heard in René Santuc's People's Court. Among the prisoners, a former deputy appointed to the Vichy National Council. His name was Louis Levder. He would later write of his 16 days of incarceration, describing the detention conditions at the Institut Dentaire in notebooks. This is what he wrote. The room we were in was noisy. We saw new prisoners arriving all the time, some of whom had bloody faces and beaten up mouths, signs of serious beatings. There was a woman prisoner who caught Louis Levedaire's attention. It was Madeleine Goa. Just a few meters away from him, Madeleine was being interrogated by a particularly violent member of the resistance. Would you shut up? One of the guards with a club yelled suddenly, dirty bitch, take this, this, and this. As Levder watched, the guard lashed out furiously at Madeleine Goa. The woman put her arm over her head, bent over, under the barrage of blows from the club. I felt sick. Madeleine endured this brutal treatment for four days, constantly maintaining her innocence. But for her jailers, she was guilty. And the verdict came on August 29th, 1944. Madeleine was taken into the courtyard of the Institute and placed against this wall. Once again, Louis Levder witnessed the scene. I saw the woman pushed against the wall. I saw them blindfold her. I saw her stick her tongue out at her executioners. I saw them stand in front of her, rifles on their shoulders. 
I couldn't watch what happened next. I heard the shots. Madeleine Goa would be found with several bullets in her body. According to the official police report drawn up two years later, Madeleine and her husband were completely innocent. The investigation would establish that they were true patriots. They provided help to resistance fighters and Jews sought by the police during the occupation. The tragic story of Madeleine Goa and her husband is not the only case of abuse committed by the people's courts set up by the resistance. During the liberation, hundreds of French people throughout the entire country suffered from this vigilante justice. This murderous purge was impossible to control. For General de Gaulle, who had been running the provisional government of France for several weeks, the situation was dire. Il y a une conquête, une lutte pour le pouvoir réel, c'est à qui investira les ministères, qui nommera euh, les chefs de bureau, l'administration. Et donc, euh, cette lutte, ben, elle passe dans une phase que, évidemment, qui n'est pas spectaculaire et tout, mais qui s'appelle le rétablissement de la légalité républicaine. General de Gaulle turned to the police to restore law and order. The police, the vast majority of whom had collaborated with Nazi Germany, but which had been purged of its most compromised elements. One of the first measures taken by the security forces was to stop the abuses committed by the resistance members, such as those in charge at the Institute. On September the 3rd, 1944, a directive from the Paris police chief was crystal clear. No arrests may be made by anyone other than law enforcement agents. Les arrestations sont désormais réservées à la police officielle qui s'épure, qui vit des moments difficiles, mais à la police officielle. Euh, on ne peut plus retenir des gens prisonniers, les séquestrer. On ne peut évidemment ni les torturer ni les exécuter. All of the people's courts, therefore, had to be disbanded. But this was far from the reality. Some die-hard groups had no intention of obeying the law. One such case was René Santuc. But why? According to historians, he was a member of the Communist Party, and certain of its leaders did not trust the justice re-established by General de Gaulle, a justice they felt no longer belonged to the people. Le Parti communiste considère de Gaulle comme euh, euh, quelqu'un dont il faut se méfier, quelqu'un qui est un représentant euh, de la haute bourgeoisie. Peut-être que euh, eh bien, euh, les vrais coupables, aux yeux des communistes, ne seront pas sanctionnés. Par contre, le tribunal populaire ne fera pas de cadeau. As a result, René Santig transferred only some of his prisoners to the police but refused to turn over all of them. At that moment, he became an outlaw. And all those who had maintained any connections whatsoever with the Germans during the war were enemies to be killed. Every suspect was therefore guilty. In all, in the space of three weeks, 40 people were executed at the Institut Dentaire. René Santuc and his men finally left the Institute on September the 15th, 1944. A police investigation was opened after the Institute closed. We returned to the police archives to examine the conclusions in the report on René Santuc. His file contained all sorts of documents, some describing his involvement as a revolutionary labor unionist, a man committed to the doctrines of the Communist Party. Other documents cover his detention during the war at the Clairvaux Penitentiary. 
But regarding the Institut Dentaire that he ran during the liberation, the police report is surprisingly empty. Were the police simply uninterested? Had he been protected? After the liberation, the French courts launched a criminal investigation, but charges against René Santuc were dropped for this reason. The public prosecutor did not provide proof that the crimes for which René Santuc was charged were entirely separate from the resistance effort and liberation of the national territory. As a result, the charges are dropped in this case. Paris Court of Appeal, July 7th, 1955. René Santuc was therefore never prosecuted. And in the 1950s, he became a city councillor for the town of Malakoff, a Paris suburb. Today, the Institut Dentaire is a health centre run by the city of Paris, a place that is historically important and yet, and yet, nowhere on the premises is there any indication of the 40 people who were executed during the liberation between August the 20th and September the 15th, 1944, by members of the resistance. In part, this was because the people of France were rediscovering freedom and looking toward the future. The liberation marked the end of four years of occupation, and a single hope was springing up in everyone's hearts, finally returning to normal life. But what the French people didn't know is that in the months to come, their everyday lives would be even more difficult than during the occupation they were facing a life and death threat. They would be hungry, very hungry. L'espoir des Français, et surtout des citadins, il faut bien voir cette disparité-là, c'est de manger. C'est de penser que le départ des Allemands rimera avec abondance. Que les Français passeront, ils passeront d'une économie de pénurie à une économie d'abondance. Euh, le bout du tunnel est encore loin. Some of the situations the French knew all too well from the occupation. The interminable lines at food shops, which they thought had disappeared, became much worse. Ginette Vergès remembers it well. During the liberation, she was 18 and lived in Montrouge, near Paris. The eldest in a family of four children, she was responsible for obtaining the food to feed everyone. Faire la queue, ça c'était les trois quarts de notre vie. On, on, pensait, on ne pensait qu'à ça. C'était très, 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 très lent. Vous avanciez de deux pas, et puis on attendait encore, et puis c'était comme ça. Et vous, il arrivait que vous fassiez la fameuse queue, que vous espériez avoir quelque chose, vous arriviez, il n'y avait plus rien. The entire country was suffering from a shortage of food. Paulette Carieu from Cherbourg is now 95. During the liberation, she was 25. The mother of a two-year-old daughter, she woke up every day at 5 a.m. to be the first in line to ensure that she could bring some small thing back to her family. There were distributions, but not every day. It depends on the ravitaillement of the commerçants. When we knew that there would be something good, we would go to the queue of bonheur. But getting up at dawn was not always enough because the stores ran out of food and the signs that had already been posted on closed shop fronts during the occupation reappeared more frequently. They said, no more meat. And even no more potatoes or no eggs, no rabbits, no poultry. Some even told customers, don't bother waiting. On croit que la guerre est finie, puis elle n'est pas, au point de vue euh, euh, restriction, c'est pas fini. Hein. C'était pas fini. Il y a des fois où on aurait donné vraiment très cher pour pouvoir goûter une pomme de terre. Mais je vous assure, on a manqué de vraiment 
de l'essentiel. C'était pas facile. C'était pas facile. Faced with these shortages, the French became openly angry. They were demonstrating all over France. Mothers held signs demanding better supplies and basic goods, milk for their children. In large cities, residents started to organize for food supplies. In Paris, for example, the gardens of large public buildings were transformed into giant vegetable plots. Like this one at the Invalides, opposite the Grand Palais. And even in the official residence of the head of government at Matignon. Loss had to be kept to an absolute minimum, so people planted hardy vegetables. Rutabagas, Jerusalem artichokes, potatoes, which are all very filling. And for all the products they needed so badly in their everyday lives, the French became incredibly resourceful. To make fake coffee, for example, they used the same recipe as during the occupation. They roasted barley, ground it up in a mill, added boiling water, and that was it. But Jeanette, a Parisian, would have been happy to forget the taste of this fake coffee that she so detested during the war. C'était mauvais. Ça avait été grillé. Ça vous est un jus marron, point barre. La seule chose que ça apportait, c'était un peu de chaleur, parce que vous buviez chaud. The French may have been inventive, but it wasn't enough. To feed themselves properly, more and more people turned to alternative systems, particularly the black market, as during the occupation. From the sale of goods under the table to ultra-organized networks, these parallel markets skyrocketed during the liberation, and gangs even appeared. Virtually every shopkeeper turned to these illegal markets to obtain supplies every day. This traffic in food was not limited to shopkeepers, each working individually. It included large, highly organized rackets that made fortunes. Illegal markets that were supplied by accomplices who were supposedly above all suspicion. American soldiers, the GIs. While the French were starving, the American soldiers had all the food they wanted. They even had plenty to spare. The American army was supplying four to 5,000 calories per day for each soldier, an enormous amount compared to the 900 calories of Parisians. So very quickly, a few unscrupulous GIs took advantage of this opportunity to do business on the French black market. Even today, this gray area of the liberation is not well known but it is coming to light through the work of two young historians, Arthur Mema and Noémie Fossé. In 1945, the affairs that have been dismantled, I've repertoried more than 450 affairs. It's quite enormous. We talk about several million dollars of merchandise at the scale of the war. News of this disturbing situation reached the United States. The press picked up the subject in 1945. The Yank, a magazine for American soldiers, made it the cover story in May of 45, with the headline, The Lowdown on the GI Racketeers in Paris. The article compared them to the gangs of Chicago, the most dangerous in the United States, and their leaders to the most feared organized crime boss of all time, Al Capone. These gangs were organized with the same sweet, ruthless efficiency that marked the Capone mob of Chicago in the 1920s. Most often, the leader of these gangs was a former GI or a deserter, who then recruited other deserters to join their ranks. Les déserteurs, enfin, c'était pas, c'était pas difficile de les trouver puisque les déserteurs généralement se trouvaient dans des hôtels. 
ou dans des cafés. Je lui ai demandé de faire partie du gang. Mais pour faire partie du gang, il fallait qu'il fasse euh, ses preuves, en fait. Et la première chose qu'il demandait c'est euh, aux futurs membres d'un gang, c'était d'aller voler un camion rempli de chargement. C'était leur billet d'entrée pour, euh, pour faire partie de ce gang, en fait. And once they had joined the gang, nothing stopped these men. They didn't hesitate to attack and rob their former war buddies. One place, however, was the scene of multiple, particularly violent attacks. It was on this road, which the Americans nicknamed the Red Ball Express, a strategic 450-kilometer access linking Saint-Lô in Normandy to Soissons in Picardy. Every day, a non-stop line of trucks carrying goods rolled on to supply the troops on the front. More than 12,000 tons of goods were carried every day, a perfect target for the racketeers. Entre le Cavados, l'heure et l'heure et la région parisienne, en fait, là, en plein milieu, là, c'était la vallée des pirates. C'est là où se, se passaient les détournements de marchandises, en fait. This is how they attacked the convoys, a scenario straight out of a western stagecoach robbery. Comme c'était des soldats, ils servaient de leur arme de service. Ils se mettaient sur la voie, ils faisaient stopper le chargement. They worked in groups of three or four, carrying out several attacks each week, in different places to avoid arrest. Les attaques à armée se font par vagues successives. C'est des, des délinquants mobiles, on va dire, des grands délinquants mobiles. Hundreds of tons of goods were stolen from the American army. It all had to be sold on the black market. But the GIs didn't speak a word of French and had no contacts on the ground. And that's where local dealers stepped in. Il est quand même beaucoup plus simple pour un soldat d'écouler sa marchandise auprès d'un intermédiaire qui va s'occuper de la revente au détail que effectivement de la revente directement, euh, en, disons en plein air, à tout l'ensemble des civils. One of these French dealers appeared in an article in one of the most widely read American magazines of the time, Life. This is the dealer Jean Oudard, nicknamed Monsieur Jean. According to the article, he was part of a gang of GIs working in Paris, the Voltaire Gang. A man with a long criminal record. He apparently served time in prison and may even have been a murderer. If these gangs of former GIs worked with this type of person, it was because they were generally well connected in the world of organized crime. Ce genre de personne n'a pas commencé sa carrière d'un coup quand les Américains sont arrivés. Il faut quand même une certaine forme d'organisation et de connaissance de façon de procéder. The job of these middlemen was to sell the goods to wholesalers on the black market. And it was crucial to sell them as quickly as possible, because these trucks full of boxes and crates hidden in warehouses could quickly attract the attention of the authorities. So they slashed their prices, up to two to three times cheaper than other fences on the black market. For example, one kilo of sugar sold for an average of 200 francs on the French black market, but sugar stolen from the American army cost 70 francs at most. C'est vraiment une bonne technique commerciale, quoi. Je pense parce que déjà, ce qu'ils volaient, c'était... Ben, ils volaient ça, ils volaient, donc c'était gratuit. C'était que du bénéfice pour eux de, de, de vendre cela, de vendre tout ce qu'ils volaient. This underground market earned a great deal of money for the gangs of former GIs and their middlemen. The American press at the time mentioned colossal sums. In three months, one of the largest crime rings earned nearly one million francs stories that tarnished the image of the entire American army. Mais si certains soldats américains commencent à se comporter comme des gangsters, cela pose un énorme problème d'image pour l'armée qui a une guerre à gagner et qui a besoin que les populations civiles la soutiennent derrière. General Eisenhower, commander in chief of the Allied forces, took on the problem. In an internal memo we obtained, dated January 24, 1945, the general sent a warning to his troops. It listed the main problems concerning the behavior of GIs in France. 
excessive drunkenness, sex crimes, but also large-scale participation in black market activities. The message was clear. Stronger disciplinary controls and severity were required. On the ground, the response was rapid. The American military police conducted crackdowns. It carried out waves of arrests, notably one very large sweep. 177 soldiers received exemplary sentences of 50 years in prison. These were severe sanctions, but they had a limited impact. Parallel markets flourished long after France was liberated. And the population had to wait four years until 1949 before the rationing system would end. The end of the Nazi occupation did not coincide with the return to everyday life and that's where the entire history of the liberation lies. It was a crucial period during which the fate of the country was played out. A period of joy and chaos, during which the French took up arms against the enemy, but also against each other. But it was a period dominated by a single goal, to retake control of the country's destiny and become free again.